Tonight at 4 a.m. in the morning, Ukrainian drones reached Moscow once again. We're talking about a few drones, less than a five. Moscow air defense was active and the Russian Minister of Defense claims that the Moscow air defense shot down all of the drones and the damage was done by falling debris. Drones explode, the fireball falls down and that's what made the damage. In all of this footage you can see the explosions or see the drones or hear the bangs. <laughs> Attacks on Moscow with Ukrainian drones have become more frequent in the recent days. And the goal of these attacks is not specifically to take out any military installation, although that might be the target. The fact is that Moscow is such a big of a metropole, it's a huge city, that military targets there are so numerous that it would take a lot of time to take them out. So I think these drone attacks are more to send the presence of war to the Moscovites, to the Moscow people. So they would see these drones and they would see the Moscow air defense active, hear those bangs and to make it harder for the Moscow residents to ignore this war. One of the drones hit the Expo Center. And actually here is a report from the Russian leading propagandist Solovyov, I'll read it to you. This is what Solovyov writes in his telegram. Explosions in Moscow and Moscow region. The enemy is attacking the capital of Russia. The residents of Moscow and the region massively report the roar of explosions. They thunder in the area of Krasnogorsk, Idintsova, and near Moscow City. Moscow City is an area in Moscow. Enemy drones are again trying to attack our facilities. He puts it quite poetically, the roar of drones. Also another huge thing that these drones do is force all of the planes that are in the sky to remain in the sky and all of the planes that have landed to remain on the ground. Basically they stop the work of airports. For example, Vnukova International Airport in Moscow suspended all flights after the duration of the attack for unknown time and if these attacks are frequent then people from Moscow cannot fly around and they again suffer because of Russian attack on Ukraine. I think this is the goal of these attacks on Moscow to make the Moscowites feel that Russia is in war because one of Putin's goal is to isolate the bigger cities from war. Most of the mobilized come from their rural areas especially from the far east where the living quality is a lot lower and the wages are a lot lower so what the Ministry of Defense offers these troops is a medium Moscow wage which wouldn't send any Moscowite to war because it's nothing for them but for the people living in the Russian Far East it's a whole years of income. Perhaps we're used to thinking of Russia as one big backwards country but actually Moscow being such a metropole it has same kind of people that New York has or Los Angeles has. Uh, big city people doing their work, being businessmen, businesswomen, bloggers, influencers, exactly the same. So here I want to illustrate this point and uh, give you the interview of one Moscow woman who comments what she feels about the drone attacks, which are regular now. Fine, let them work. I'm not hurt. I'm not threatening them either. Adventure? Adventure. Well, what can I do? It's not like I'm gonna broom them away. <laughs> Our windows don't open. What is going on? Why are drones attacking a huge business quarter in Moscow? Young man, that's a provocative question. So people in Russia, of course, are used to labeling topics as provocative or dangerous because some of the topics are not to be talked about because the state doesn't want them to be discussed. That is the goal of the Putin's government also to force some topics out of people's minds. And it's very effective, unfortunately, because this woman immediately recognizes this topic as dangerous, don't speak about this publicly is what goes on in her head, and she's like, that's provocative, we cannot go there. I'll say something now and tomorrow they'll come for me, so I won't say anything. She knows how to exist in Russia. See, you need this kind of defense mechanisms in your head to exist in Russia, because otherwise you say the wrong thing and you will be, you will disappear. So that's it from this video, but it illustrates perfectly how people have managed to survive in Moscow or in Russia at all. You just don't talk about some topics. Now, my friends, I want to guide your attention to something that the Western analysts don't really talk about much, which is the peculiarity of the Russian mindset. When the war started, the Western analysts said that Russian economy is going to collapse immediately. That didn't happen. Russian economy proved a lot more resilient than the analysts in the West thought. Russian economy is not doing great, but it's not collapsing anytime soon. The same phenomenon was going on with the drone attacks against Moscow. I remember the very first drone attack, it was a huge deal. 
And then it became more frequent and analysts started saying that this, and, and myself actually, started saying that this will bring the Moscovites to the reality. They will see the horrible truth of war and they have to suffer. They cannot fly anymore. They hear bangs and air defense every night. They cannot sleep. They will turn against Putin and against this war. Well, the truth is, according to questionnaires done in Moscow, People in Moscow are simply getting used to these attacks and it does not affect their support for the special military operation or for Putin. As in Ukraine, people have gotten used to the war. Same is happening now in Russia. And these attacks against Moscow have an effect, definitely. But it doesn't have an effect that the Western analysts have predicted it to be. A poll conducted in August by Russian Field showed that 46% of the Moscow residents would not cancel Vladimir Putin's decision to launch a military operation if such an opportunity arose. So 46% wouldn't say no to the operation if, if they could. That is half of the Moscow population, which is, what, over 8 million people? 9 million people. 35% of the respondents opposed cancelling the beginning of the operation. So another 35% don't even want to cancel it. Even after these drone attacks to Moscow, people are still supporting this special military operation. This shows how little understanding the Western analysts have about the Russian mindset. And it also is a hit against me because I'm also opening my eyes to this. It's not as black and white as I thought it would be. Among young people aged 18 to 26 years old, 47 hold such opinion. And 18 to 26 is military age population of Russia, which might be sent to the front in the next mobilization that is coming in a few months. It's my prediction. And they wouldn't say no to a special military operation if asked. This statistic brings me and other Western analysts pretty quickly back to reality. That is, the opinion and the support for Putin in Russia is not weakening. Perhaps it is even strengthening. Now, my friends, let's go to the Black Sea. Let's go to Sevastopol and actually 237 kilometers, exactly, southwest from Sevastopol. So it's pretty much in the middle of the Black Sea, in the center area. Ukrainian sea drones once again attacked the Russian Black Sea fleet. They attacked two ships. One of the ships was called Pitlivi and the other one Vasil Bikov. The Vasil Bikov was the very same ship that about a week ago stopped the Turkish merchant ship. That ignored their warnings and warning shots. So the Vasil Bikov deployed a helicopter and boarded the Turkish merchant ship, searched it and then let them go. So this very ship was attacked today. The Russian Ministry of Defense claims that these sea drones that Ukraine uses in this attack that they were destroyed by weapons on board of these two ships. Now we don't have any pictures or videos of any kind of damage. It just remained to be seen if the drones connected to the hulls of the ship or they were indeed destroyed. But the fact that Ukraine is attacking these ships does enough already to keep the Russian Black Sea fleet on edge, always ready and in a tense situation. Also, after the last time Vasil Pikov stopped the Turkish merchant ship, yesterday Turkey officially sent a warning to Russia saying that these actions are escalating tensions in the Black Sea and they suggested Russia to avoid these actions in the future. These actions mean stopping Turkish merchant ships. But Turkish warnings, as vague as it sounds, the yesterday's warning, is very serious because let's go back to 2015. 2015. Both Russia and Turkey say that the Russian Su-24, an all-weather attack aircraft, was shot down by Turkish F-16s in the Turkey-Syria border on the 24th of November. As you can see from this photo, the Russian Su-24 crossed over the Turkish land salient here into Syria. It was in the Turkish airspace for about five minutes, as you can see, a very short amount of time. And the Turkish plane says that they warned the Russian Su-24 10 times over the span of five minutes. And then after the 10th time, the Russians didn't respond. They simply shot the Su-24 down with air-to-air -air missiles. Now, five minutes crossing the Turkish airspace was enough for Turkey to shoot down this Russian plane. So they understand the language of showing brute force. And if you know this event, the warning that Turkey sent yesterday, as vague as it was, 
Russians remember this incident and the Turkish remember this incident. Turkey is not afraid to use brute force to protect their borders. So I think Russia will take this warning seriously. But my friends, now we go to the very far east of Russia and Japan actually. The news comes from the Japanese island of Hokkaido and the Russian island of Sakhalin and in between of those islands there's this waterway and the reports came that Russian Chinese combined fleet sailed through this waterway and they crossed into Japanese territorial waters. Why is this important? Well, it is Russia and China both flexing their muscles in the Sea of Japan area, which is to balance the force here of NATO, United States, South Korea, Japan, Australia and Taiwan. Japan once held a claim to the Sakhalin Island, this huge island right here, it's big enough to be one of the Japanese home islands actually. Now Japan doesn't lay a claim to this island anymore, but what they do claim up until today, up until this very modern time is the Kuril Islands. You can see the text right here, these small islands that Russia is occupying right now, Japan still claims them and it's an ongoing dispute with Russia. So this Russian-Chinese combined fleet sailing through Japanese territorial waters definitely is testing the limits, testing the waters as it is, literally, of how Japan and the NATO presence in this vicinity would react. And of course, no country in NATO is known for reacting as strong as Turkey. Of course, Turkey is in NATO, but they have had the biggest and strongest reactions to Russians. We cannot expect the similar reactions coming from Japan. My friends, now we go to the front lines and I'll go immediately to the northern eastern front where most of the fighting is happening and Russia has conducted here a very large scale offensive operation against Ukraine lines. So much so that Ukraine had to deploy or redeploy their reserves into the area to hold the line. And actually Russian forces occupied some forest belts, forest strips south of Vilshana, this settlement right here, very close to the front lines. This where my cursor is, Sinkivka and Vilshana, in between of those settlements there are forest belts right here and Russians occupy those. We're not talking about a big area but a big enough to mention. Russians are pushing here with Storm Z units which are prisoners but they also are using armor like tanks, BMPs, infantry fighting vehicles and this came as somewhat of a surprise to the local Ukrainian forces who then asked reinforcements to be deployed into the area which Ukraine has now done but Russia is renewing their offensives every day every morning every night. Time will tell if Russian offensive will have any kind of success for them as of now the advancing is slow but there is some. And I hate to report this, but there are significant Ukrainian casualties in the area. So much so that I cannot ignore them. You could say that the Kupiansk front for Russia right now is their main goal, the main offensive operation. Most of the resources go into this area and also it's one of the areas that they have had minor successes in. But my friends, now I want to read you a joint statement, or some of it at least, of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, the three politics, all of the prime ministers of those three countries have signed this joint statement. I want to read you the third paragraph, some of it. We firmly believe that only NATO membership will provide Ukraine with security guarantees and a credible deterrent needed to avert future aggression by expansionist Russia. Ukraine's NATO membership will also substantially strengthen Euro-Atlantic security and stability. Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania joint agreement supports Ukrainian accession into NATO. Talking about NATO and actually when I'm proud about this latest development of this joint statement, what is more of a humiliation is the next news. It's a classic communication failure. The chief of staff to the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said this to his audience a few days ago. I think that a solution could be for Ukraine to give up territory and get NATO membership in return. This is his official wording. He said that this war can be ended if Ukraine swallows up the losses, cedes the territory that Russia has occupied right now to Russia, and then they will get the NATO membership for the future. Most countries in the NATO have said that they respect fully Ukrainian sovereign integrity and they will support Ukraine until Ukraine achieves this sovereign integrity of their country, which means also liberating Crimea, southern Ukraine, all of the areas since 1991. And this is why today NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg needed to apologize and clear up this mess, this communication failure that NATO will support Ukraine to the very end of this war and to the very end of Ukraine's achieved territorial integrity and 
ceding some of Ukraine's territory into Russia is out of the table. Now these communication failures are a big deal and I need to report on them because Russia can take this information and spin it and reuse it for their internal country's consumption. The Russian propaganda machine is very effective. This is food for the Russian propaganda machine because they don't even need to change much. They just take the Western headlines and Western media text and in this case they don't even change anything. They are saying, yeah, even NATO says that Ukraine needs to cede its territory to Russia. Everybody agrees. So these communication failures, they do happen, but the less the better. My friends, in this video we see Russian Storm Z units that have stolen some Ukrainian bicycles. How do I know that they're Storm Z units? Well, I don't actually, but looking at the outfits and, and the mannerism of the soldiers, they probably are Storm Z units, which are units of uh, ex-convicts or convicts still, prisoners in Russia, that were under Wagner, but they have been assimilated into the Russian Ministry of Defense after Wagner was sent away from Ukraine. They have stolen some bicycles. But what I want to also comment on is this guy's Kalashnikov and the magazines actually. Look at also the gear, they don't really have much gear. All of their uniforms are different and the, the gear, they mostly have Kalashnikov and a few magazines and bullets. They don't seem to have much food or shovels or uh, any kind of sleeping equipment. And look, this huge Kalashnikov banana magazine, I'm guessing this magazine is one magazine and then another one taped on top of it. So if you change the magazine, you can just turn it around to the other side. The miners with this kind of design or this kind of taping your magazines together, I understand if you tape them together like two equal sized magazines, but if you tape one to the very edge of the other one, if you're on the ground and have to shoot uh, lying on your stomach, which happens all the time in every battle in war, then it's very difficult to shoot this weapon since the magazine is a banana magazine, a very long one, and you cannot shoot it lying on your stomach because your weapon will be pointed upwards. So that's the minus part of it. The plus part of it is that you can really very fast change the magazine and keep firing. But it doesn't seem to bother this guy. He's happy about his bicycle and other four Storm Z Soldiers here are also happy. Now this face here, I would also overanalyze it as a very drunken and hangover face, which means that the usage of alcohol is probably very rampant. I wouldn't say the usage of drugs, because they probably don't have drugs on the front line, but they definitely have vodka. And they seem to be very happy about these bicycles. A bicycle in the military time for an infantryman is, is a gift really is, because you can really save your legs using a bicycle. My friends, here are the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense listed Russian losses of the past 24 hours, 18th of August 2023. Now I want to clear this up, I have gotten a lot of comments that why don't I read the Ukrainian losses? I would, my friends, but there are there is no official list about it. There are estimates, these are also estimates, they are not uh, facts, they're estimates of Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. Russia doesn't give us a list like that. Uh, so I have nothing to balance this with, so I'm just reading this one. We have 460 liquidated Russian personnel, 3 tanks, 12 armored personnel vehicles, 24 artillery systems, 2 helicopters, which I mentioned yesterday and in today's list, boom, here they are. 4 UAVs and 17 vehicles and fuel tanks and 10 special equipment. Overall, about the 7 day average of losses, yesterday they were higher. These losses are one day behind every time, so if some of the battles I'm reporting today, the losses will come tomorrow about this battle. My friends, I want to take this moment and thank the Patreons. These people have supported me for four to five years, some of them at least. And YouTube is a very not stable job. You never know if you're going to get views. You never know what kind of money are you going to get. So the honest answer is that Patreons keep this job for me stable. So I, I'm really thankful for these guys allowing me to do what I do. And I want to butcher five new names. Pikle 1007, Pilje Joe Bogden, Tod Perkan, Matheus Ferreira, Graeme Almond. Thank you, Mr. Almond and other patrons for supporting the channel. Also, my friends, I would guide you to my Instagram account where I post cool photos, reels and stories about what I do in Ukraine or Estonia, about my secret projects. I'll see you there, my friends. And until my next video, Stay cool and bye-bye.